Cool. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Jason Immerman. I work for Zipcar. This is Derek Van Esch, who works for HS2 Solutions. Uh, and we're going to be talking about how Zipcar has recently been using Concourse in order to manage our increased product and process complexity, um, or more specifically, how we use Concourse for all of the things at all the times. Uh, so before we get started, a uh, quick uh, fire exit announcement. Cool. So as I said, my name is Jason Immerman. Uh, I work for Zipcar. And uh, Zipcar provides on-demand cars, wheels when you want them. Uh, and as a result, we do a lot of things with um, scaling fleet management and uh, Internet of Things as we pull data from our cars. And I'm Derek Van Ash. I work for a company called HS2 Solutions. HS2 is a digital brand experience agency. We offer the uh, full range of services, including development, management consulting, QA, analytics, pretty much everything in between as well. Um, HS2 and Zipcar have been partnering on different part projects for over seven years, and currently I'm working with Jason and his team to build out their pipelines in Concourse, uh, trying to optimize their development workflow. Cool. So before we jump into Concourse, I'm going to give a little bit of context as to where Zipcar is with our tech stack. And uh, hopefully some of you saw this in the keynote with uh, Andy and Holly. Um, but right now Zipcar is replatforming. So we're a major replatforming going from a monolith to a set of microservices. Um, and we're using uh, Cloud Foundry tools for our deployment, our orchestration, and a lot of our monitoring, uh, things like Bosch, Diego, and Loggerator. Uh, and we built this abstraction layer that we call Savannah uh, that really makes it easier for us to host and do all these things with a set of microservices. Um, and it's super cool. That's not what this talk is about, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, uh, other than to say two pertinent details, one of which is throughout this talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference an app or a microservice or a service. I'm talking about the same thing, but at Zipcar, we have a very opinionated uh, idea of what a service is or a microservice, um, but Savannah can host them all. Uh, the other piece there is I'm gonna, we're going to reference deployment manifests. So a deployment manifest is a file that contains the state of an environment. Um, it's effectively an array that's a set of services, their names, their versions, the number of instances, et cetera. Um, so that will come up a few times. So this replatforming has been super cool, but it's also increased the complexity of our system a lot. So a few numbers there. Um, we have now over 80 services, and that number is only going to keep growing. Um, we have over 25 production environments. Uh, that's because in addition to the Zipcar solution, we also have a white-labeled uh, solution called Local Motion by Zipcar. Uh, and we're using the same technology to work with our, our, um, our parent company, Avis Budget Group, um, on some uh, connected car stuff. So um, we also have teams that can choose their own languages, their own frameworks, their own runtimes. And as a result, we have a lot of varied host configurations of what we need in the Docker images and the parent Docker images that they use. Um, and then finally, our teams are widely distributed. So geographically, and as a result, they're distributed in time zones. Um, so in pictures, uh, we're going from something that looks like this to something that looks more like this. Uh, you don't need to read that diagram. It's really just so there's more stuff. Um, and so the, the problem statement really becomes, how do we minimize the human error while still being able to fully understand our environments and safely delegate ownership to the individual teams? That last part is really important to us. We want the teams to be able to own the code from development to production to support to interacting with users and getting technical feedback. Uh, and we want to take away a lot of the stuff that they need to deal with in order to do those things. Cool. So uh, in looking for a solution, we came up with a few main tenets. Uh, one is communication. We want the communication to be transparent, centralized, and consistent. Uh, as an uh, individual engineer, I want to know what's going on with my builds, what's going on with my apps, where they are in any particular environment. As a stakeholder, I want to know the same things, but in a little bit of a different perspective. Change management needs to be lightweight and auditable. Um, specifically, that lightweight piece, we want to make sure that people can apply these solutions to really a general set of technology, um, and so that a lot of our artifacts, our publications, things like that are built in a fairly consistent way. Um, cascading changes, if I make a change over here to a package, that package gets to where it needs to be over here, and ultimately that thing that is using that package is deployed to all the right environments, and then I can actually check that that happened. Uh, and then finally, managed configuration. We don't want snowflakes. We want to be able to redeploy and rebuild and have it be the same thing. Uh, and isolation. Let's say if I build a bad version of an app, I want to be able to build that same artifact um, without thinking that the bad version is going to have somehow impacted the good version. So we chose to concourse all the things. Um, and so in the next slide, I'm going to show a general solution, and then I'm going to pass it off to Derek to, to break down how we're going to go through this talk. Um, the general solution I'm going to show does not contain all the ways in which we use Concourse, because we use it across our entire system, our infrastructure, everything. It's going to show a high-level idea, and then just kind of to give a flavor. Um, and then what we're going to do is try to give you some scenarios about how we actually use Concourse uh, to show how you might be able to use it in your organization. 
So that solution looks a little bit like this. We have pipelines for things like building our Docker images, our parent Docker images, for building all of these individual microservices, uh, for deployments to all of our staging and production environments, um, and, then, and then a bunch of other things on the right side. Um, but the, the main important piece of this slide is the center. So in the center, all of our artifacts are built by Concourse. All of them are built in a consistent way. They're rebuildable, and no one is really manually going in and building and pushing to our artifact stores. Uh, with Slack, all of the communication from Concourse about our pipelines and everything else is going to the same set of channels. Um, and those channels follow a pattern so that as a stakeholder, and individual engineer, I know where to look. And I know that I can look there and feel comfortable that I'm getting the right information all the time. Uh, cool. So now I'll hand it off to Derek. All right. So before we get started, one thing I want to reiter reiterate that Jason mentioned earlier. Um, Zipcar uses Concourse in many different places and in a lot of different ways. Uh, so many different ways that we don't really have time to really dive into any meaningful detail in the time we have allowed. So what we decided to do was just identify a few different scenarios that might be relatable to a lot of different types of organization and just kind of break down, you know, like discuss a little bit of, about the workflows involved and how Concourse enters the picture. Um, so as you can see here, the, this is what the scenarios are. And without further ado, let's go into the first one. So. Let's say a developer wants to make a change to an existing application. So what I'm showing here is uh, just a basic outline of a process that you know, a lot of different organizations might follow, might vary slightly a little bit, but especially if they, they use Git as source control. Um, so first off, a developer would create a branch, um, then make some code changes on them, and uh, you know, like they would uh, make, iterate on these changes as they further test uh, once they're ready. They would create a pull request, maybe iterate some more on, the, on their code changes. And once everyone is happy with that result, they would merge it to a master branch. Um, then deploy to staging where some manual testing, some automated testing would occur. And once you know, all stakeholders are happy with the result, then we would deploy it to production. Um, so what we're going to do today is just focus on the items in the uh, dotted rectangle here. So the items in green, um, actually the ones in the dotted, before I go further, these have concourse pipelines associated to them. So the ones in green are basically automated triggers and anything in yellow, which in this case the deployment to production is uh, manually triggered. So first off, when it's time to create a pull request, a pipeline that looks like this gets executed. So for those that are not familiar, this is just an example of a pipeline screen within Concourse. And again, for those not familiar with Concourse, um, within Concourse you have pipelines. And with pipelines you have resources and, uh, and jobs. So like a resource could be you know, any object that you might want to trigger action off of or any object you might want to update. Um, some examples might include, you know, like a Docker repository or a Git repository or a database, um, things of that nature. And uh, jobs are the action you actually take. So to start out, the, uh, we have a dependencies test. And it's a, it's a check that essentially looks out any kind of uh, internal service dependencies that a particular application has. Just make sure that version exists. There's no circular dependencies, things of that nature. And uh, moving on, we also run some integration tests. So automated tests to ensure that the code will work on upper environments. And also, we run an internationalization job. So essentially, we take a look and see what languages are configured for a particular application and generate the proper translations there. And then finally, we create a Docker image and publish it to all the Docker repositories we need to. And uh, one thing to note with these uh, Docker versions that we tag, they're, you know, we can overwrite them. So it's not limited to just one. So it's essentially a snapshot version of that uh, particular application. So once it's time to merge the code to master, so we have a very similar looking pipeline here. There's a couple of differences though. Um, so one is a uh, master dependency analysis job. And what that does is just conducts a security vulnerability check against the code and also make sure that all API dependencies, external dependencies are up to date. There's no newer versions of those out there. Again, moving along, we uh, have a Docker build step that, again, creates a Docker image, pu publishes it up to the Docker repositories. And, but this time, when we tag it, it's a lasting version. So you can have exactly one version of that. If you want to something change, then you have to actually bump up the version again. 
And uh, finishing off here, we have a uh, deployment manifest update. And this is a very key part of the process that Jason alluded to earlier. So essentially what that is, it's, it's a per environment configuration. One of the things in there is, is that it has all the current version of an application per environment. So at, in the, at this point, we update that uh, version. Um, once it's code, once it's version master, we have like the hot off the presses version in our manifest for a staging environment by default. And that brings us to deployment time. So once that happens, we kick off a pipeline, pretty simple one that looks a lot like this. Uh, again, we update that deployment manifest, and by default, it will actually kick off this pipeline, checks to see what, if the uh, deployment manifest was updated, and then actually deploys it to our staging environment automatically, which is nice. And then once it's time to deploy to production, we have a very similar looking pipeline, but this time um, it's manually triggered. Um, but essentially, it's like the same mechanism in order to deploy. We update a deployment manifest for the version of that application as well as any other application we want to push out to prod. So with that, um, we'll move along to another scenario to create a new microservice, let's say. So again, the workflow looks very similar to the one if you want to change an existing microservice. But before we can get to that point, we need a little bit of setup. So. Again, the uh, a developer might create a repository first and then create a concourse pipeline. So for our sake, again, we're gonna focus on the item in the dotted rectangle that's creating our concourse pipeline. And we've actually chosen to automate this process for a few different reasons. So as uh, Jason mentioned earlier, Zipcar has over 80 microservices that's counting every day. Um, not all developers at Zipcar are necessarily well-versed with concours, know how to create pipelines and things of that nature, but they don't really have to be. We've created a nice little process to seamlessly integrate with uh, an agile development workflow. So having a nice powerful tool like a concourse pipeline is you know, just a matter of seconds away, definitely not a barrier to you know, have something sp spun up to uh, help with continuous integration. Great thing to have. Um, another reason why we chose to automate it is just issue support. So Jason's team is charged with um, supporting these pipelines. So A, having so many pipelines running, it makes it very easy to A, identify issues, but more importantly, fix issues. Um, so when you're fixing one issue for one pipeline, a lot of times it's, you know, it'll apply to many pipelines and sometimes all pipelines, which is very powerful and, and efficient, which we all like. Um, another benefit is to you know, aim towards uh, stateless infrastructure. So if we wanted to migrate to different concourse hooks for some reason, um, we can easily spin up all the pipelines that belong to that uh, concourse instance and uh, have, have it uh, up in a matter of minutes. So very nice there too. So going into the solution a little bit more detail. So we've created a command line application. It essentially allows a developer to configure a few different aspects they would like to see in their pipeline. So they can customize different types of testing that they want on it, um, which concourse instance they would like to push their pipeline to, what tech stack that their service belongs to, um, that kind of customizes actually how the pipeline runs in a lot of cases. And as well as if they want to update other deployment manifests for auto deployment. So as I mentioned earlier, by default, we will deploy to our staging environment. But if you wanted to deploy to other environments automatically as part of this uh, pipeline, you can easily do that here. So to draw your attention to the diagram at the right a little bit. So um, again, we have an application. It basically takes a smaller configuration and generates a larger configuration file that uh, Concourse can recognize. We push it out there. Um, one notable thing, we use Vault um, for sensitive data that is within our pipelines. So we'll push it out there. Um, another thing to note is that we also interact with our Git repository um, in this pipeline process. And this is kind of interesting. So. By default, the, uh, the concourse uh, Git resource that we used will pull Git, our Git server. And we found that it produced a lot of load on that server. So in order to, especially with all these microservices, we have a lot of different repositories. So what we chose to do instead is to trigger our pipelines um, based on a commit against a pull request that we showed earlier and a commit against a master branch. And uh, just by looking at this, you may wonder, well, how, how does this magic occur? So. 
we have created this application called Concourse API. And what that essentially is, it acts as a traffic cop. Um, so anytime, like I said, a commit is pushed against a pull request branch or a master branch, it'll flow through this uh, Concourse API application. And in turn, the Concourse API application is smart enough to know which pipeline to kick off, which resource to kick off to get the whole pipeline going. It's a very powerful thing. So moving on to our next scenario. Um, you might wonder how Zipcar does code, code vulnerability analysis. Um, so uh, we have the, uh, going back to our first scenario, one of the steps in our workflow was merging some code to master. Um, we have a, within that workflow step, we have a job that will actually, you know, conduct this uh, vulnerability analysis that I sort of alluded to earlier. So again, that's, it checks for old versions of API, but more importantly, any security vulnerabilities um, that might be, you know, within that uh, application. So what we actually do there, going into a little more detail, there's a, a national vulnerabilities database, which is a U.S. government hosted database of known vulnerabilities of APIs, and so we make that flow through this job. And if there's any vulnerability or old API dependency, we will post a notification to Slack, so the correct Slack channel, so any stakeholder or development team will be notified that, hey, there's a security vulnerability in your application. Um, and we'll also post it to this uh, DevMetrics database there. Um, I'll talk about that uh, in more detail in a minute here, but before I do, uh, one thing to note is that any failure here, so if there is a cold vulnerability, for example, um, although the job will fail, the pipeline will continue to flow, so we'll, we'll allow Docker images to you know, continue to be, be posted for that particular, and tagged for that particular version. Um, just allowing the different development teams to kind of prioritize like how vital they see these vulnerabilities or you know, how vital they should get up to the you know, latest version of an, an API dependency. So again, we put the control right into the developer's hands and the development team's hands so they can make an educated decision there and not have to block any kind of agile workflow. So going into a little more detail on dev metrics. So as you can see, we have wrapped this dev metrics database around a service. And again, we have it not only embedded in our pipelines, but we also have a scheduled dev metrics run. So for those cases where you know, a, an application is, isn't act actively developed, let's say it's pretty stable and there's no code changes against it, we'll at least run this um, dev metrics run that we call uh, every, once a week, and it'll essentially do the same thing. It'll look for security vulnerabilities, updated API dependencies, post to the same Slack channels, and have the development teams you know, kind of prioritize accordingly. Uh, another interesting thing to note here is we have a Hubot application, and what that is, it just takes some Slack commands, it'll interpret them, and go against our dev metrics service, and basically post the same results. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jason, who will bring us home with a couple more scenarios. Cool, thanks, Derek. So um, a lot of what Derek has shown so far uh, is uh, our pipelines within the context of a single microservice, a single application. Um, but that's not the only way that we use Concourse. It's, it's certainly the primary way. It's the, it's the way that most developers or engineers interact with Concourse. Um, but there are a bunch of things that we do outside of that. So I'm going to demonstrate a few of those more cross-cutting cross applications. So the first one, if we need to upgrade a, a package that's shared across a lot of our services, in this case, let's say we're upgrading Java, more specifically, the version of JDK. Um, so what we've done is we've wrapped the uh, remote Oracle JDK repo in a concourse resource, which means a concourse can natively interact with it. When new versions are posted, concourse will know about them. Um, and so for minor versions, we can automatically trigger the pipeline. And what's going to happen is uh, if Oracle posts a new minor version of some JDK that we're using, uh, for the major version. Uh, we are going to kick off this pipeline and automatically rebuild all the images. So the base Java image, the image that has Java as well as all the magic sauce needed to interact with Savannah, um, and the same images that are used to test within Concourse. Um, and then uh, what, what Derek showed earlier, we have a developer coming along, making some code changes, uh, unbeknownst to them, JDK has been bumped. They uh, push something up to, uh, to Git, uh, and their pipeline kicks off. Now, the magic here is that the pipeline that runs both the tests and the artifact that's built and published are using the new version of JDK. Of course, the tests can fail, and concourse, in concourse logs, you can easily see what happened, why it failed, and move from there. Um, but ideally, it's published, it works, it automatically goes to staging in the workflow Derek showed. Um, the, you know, the developer chooses when to push it out to production, and we've upgraded JDK. 
Uh, there's, there, there's a pretty big gap here, though, which is because we have over 80 microservices, that number's gonna grow. They don't all get developed very often, right? So some of them are constantly being developed, some won't get a commit for a little while. Uh, but we still need to get the new versions of, in this case, JDK up to those apps. Um, so we have this thing that we're developing in process called uh, maintenance mode. Um, and effectively, we choose some time, let's say in this case a month, and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, trigger these pipelines in a schedule, check what pipelines haven't been run in a certain amount of time, and if they haven't been run, we're gonna bump the patch version and then run the pipeline. Ideally, the test pass, we uh, publish a new artifact, we push that to staging, uh, and then we have the new version on staging with the new JDK, even though the developer didn't commit to code changes. Um, well, the developer didn't commit to code changes, so they're not expecting this new version, uh, so they're not gonna know to deploy that at production. So we use Concourse again for a bunch of reports, one of which is this uh, environment diff report. And we, for any of our staging and production environments, we can diff uh, production and we can diff staging and we can see what versions are in both, how old those are. Um, and so we publish that to a very public channel once a week. And ideally the engineer notices and say, oh, there's a new version of my app, I need to go deal with that. Um, you know, test it, push it out to production. However, they might not notice, and this is where peer pressure comes in. We have this nudging mechanism where everyone's accountable, people are talking to each other, stakeholders may notice, the peers may notice, uh, and inform the engineer, get it out to production. Um, and a quick shout out, we also have that as a Hubot command, a lot of these things for, for Slack integration. Um, so there's one more gap here. Uh, I said that ideally the test pass, the thing pushes out to staging and this environment diff report uh, picks it up. What if the test uh, started failing for whatever reason, time passed or um, the new JDK version caused the test to fail. Uh, well, that's where another report comes in, the persistent uh, pipeline failure report, which is effectively, on some interval, we check to see, has your pipeline admit a consistent failure state for X days, weeks, months, whatever? Um, and if so, we do the same thing. We publish out a report to Slack, and through that same mechanism, uh, we hope that the engineer will get it, that information, make some code changes, and usher that thing out to production. So, uh, one last scenario here. Um, is uh, continuous integrations, or continuous integration testing. Uh, so Holly uh, referenced this on the, uh, the keynote stage, um, but we do this thing called journey testing, or user journey testing, and these are really the revenue critical paths um, that are required for our system to work and our users to interact with the system, both internal and external users. And so we have a set of very stable tests that, uh, that run uh, constantly against all of our staging and production environments to make sure that these revenue critical paths are passing. Because we have all these versions of all of these apps constantly flowing into these environments and we need to make sure that they don't break things. Um, if something fails, post to Slack and all hands are on deck to get that thing fixed. Um, but one side effect here is that because uh, we're running these from Concourse, we're constantly ETLing the data from these tests into New Relic, which is an application performance monitoring tool. Um, it's really cool if you haven't used it. Um, but uh, one really nice side effect here is that we have constant uptime metrics on both our staging and production environments. So we can see how uh, quality is affected not only in production but staging because CICD comes to the fact that we can't just constantly be bringing down our staging environment. Um, we need it to be usable for people to actually test and, and things like that. Um, and so as a little bit of a side, we take this data and then we have a new Relic dashboard that we can make for any environment that gives us uptime metrics. Um, it gives us things like historical duration of the test. We can see if we have load problems um, yeah, things like that. So with that, I will hand it back to Derek to wrap up. All right, so thanks, Jason. And uh, as we talked about, uh, Zipcar uses Concourse in a lot of different ways. We covered some really fundamental basic building blocks uh, just to kind of you know get your appetite whetted a little bit. Um, uh, you know, like, like we said earlier, like it's used in a lot of different ways, a lot of different you know things. It's used you know, for other development workflows. There's nuances to the workflows we've discussed. There's a lot of in infrastructure-related workflows that it's used as well. So really neat, powerful tool. So really, I just wanted to extend an invitation. If you see either Jason or I walking around, um, feel free to stop us. We'd love to talk more about um, Concourse and how Zipcar uses Concourse. Or if you're a user of Concourse, we'd love to chat as well. There's a lot of different ways to solve you know, different problems, and it's interesting to kind of relate you know, some different uh, organizational challenges and try to come up with uh, good common solutions. Um, and also, before I close, too, I wanted to give a big shout out to Stark and Wayne. Um, they got Zipcar started with um, Concourse, got them initially implemented. So uh, thanks for that. And uh, with that, I'll just close it out. And if I think we have time for a few questions, if anyone has any questions.
I guess I don't fully understand your question. When you, when you say applications on the core versus the periphery, about that, everybody. So, so your question is around um, pulling apart a, a, a tightly integrated system is really hard. And so what, what I think you're saying is that the things in the core that are really tightly integrated are, you, you, you can't get to those right away. You have to have a, you know, a real strategic approach to those. And so to start out, you pick things that aren't quite as tightly integrated and start migrating them into the environment. Is that what you're saying? So. You want to ask the rest of your question? So, so did, we, did we do it that way? What we ended up doing is starting off with completely new functionality, and we are in the process of migrating some of that deeper, deeper integrated stuff. And we do have a strategy in place for that, but I'm not sure I can really talk about how we're going about that without divulging internal stuff. So, Does that help? Cool. Anything else? Sure. Uh, I have a question about that Cloudburst API that you guys made. Um, does that mean that you know, like in terms of triggering, that helps that trigger Cloudburst instead of the other way around? So if you turn your concourse, like you look at the penalty? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So instead of concourse pulling get, it'll basically anytime you commit to get, so like I said, the master branch or a pull request branch only, it'll flow through that concourse API and then trigger the pipeline instead of a pulling mechanism. Yeah. Webhooks. webhooks, yeah, we yep. use webhooks and there's also a PRNFB servlet that also handles the pull request. Uh, so that's kind of a, just something like a, a plugin that you put right into, in our case, Stash. Um, I, I mean, I think it's pretty solid. Like, so far, we're not, you know, we find some issues sometimes with, you know, having to configure workers and, you know, container counts, you know, getting maxed out. But then it's, you know, it's pretty tweakable. Like, you can easily just, you know, kind of scale that in a, a lot of different ways. I think we're still kind of exploring the different ways that you can do that. But so far, it's not, like, a huge problem. It's it's usually pretty attainable to, to solve that. We, we've done a few things to also mitigate that. Um, I don't know if you noticed in an earlier slide, we have multiple instances of Concourse. Um, so that we're having problems with one, and that was more of an issue in a much older version of Concourse. Um, we were able to dynamically go between them. Uh, and because we automatically can generate the pipelines, that was not too painful. Um, we also have a lot of um, monitoring set up on Concourse itself. Um, so there's um, a lot of documentation about how you can do this. Um, but Concourse is uh, always uh, emitting data that you can report upon. Um, and uh, similar to that, we built a lot of our own reporting mechanisms to, hey, if jobs are failing with a stalled worker exception, we, we get notified. Uh, and then we can go take care of it. All right, anything else? All right, well, again, approach Jason or I, and thanks for your attention.